Hi everyone, this is Becca from Becca's Music Room. I'm here today to talk about differentiating in the elementary music class. Now, this video is gonna focus mostly on how to actually split kids into different groups so that you can differentiate more efficiently. Um, I'm gonna link a blog post to a more in-depth guide that talks about not only that, but also some activities you can do because once you have your kids split up, you gotta you know, actually do something. Otherwise, it's kind of silly. If you find this video helpful at all, please make sure you like, subscribe, and share so that other people can use it as well. So the first step to differentiating is that you have to figure out what your kids already know. So that's normally in the form of some sort of pretest. Now, you can do this at the beginning of the year with like every concept you have, or you can do it unit by unit, like we're working on treble clef. Let's see if anyone knows anything about the treble clef. I like to actually kind of cheat and I'll wait until a few days into a unit to start doing things like that. Because I have found that if I, you know, I'm like, here's a treble clef, here's a quiz on things that look like a foreign language to you, the kids just kind of freak out and it just doesn't work well and none of them know it. So I usually will wait and I'll talk about it, we'll practice it for a few days and then I'll give them some sort of assessment to figure out what they know. It doesn't have to be like an assessment, like it doesn't have to be a test per se. It could be something you observe, like I have used my matching games before where students are matching the body and the top of a snowman or I have like heart ones and shamrock ones and different things. Um, and so I'll walk around and I'll just see who's able to correctly identify those and put them together and I can write it down on my clipboard. Or I love to play Kaboom with my kids and that's a really fun game. So I'll, like this is a solfege one, I'll, ha I'll have them play and I'll just walk around and I'll just check off students who are singing this one correctly or identifying them correctly if it's the treble clef one um, and different things like that. So you could do just observation, you could do a test, you could do just like an activity. Like I used my treble clef dice activity as an assessment um, and I used that to figure out groupings and things like that. But the kids didn't think they were being assessed because they were just doing something fun. And I didn't put it in the grade book as like a test. I just said, you know, it's an activity. So once I get all of that, I have to split them up. The way that I like to split kids up is to use sticky notes. So I'll take three different sticky notes. They could be the same color or different colors. You could make it fancy and like color coordinate them. Um, and I just write an X on one, a line on the other, and a check on the other one. It basically means check is they've got it or they're almost there. A line means they're getting there and an X means they have like no idea what's happening. And then I'll go through each of the grades and I'll write the kids' names down on here. Um, I've also done it when I didn't have sticky notes with just a piece of paper and I just wrote the same thing on it. This ironically is one of my pretests from the beginning of the year. Um, and I'll just write them down on there. So how I decide on the check, the X and the line is by the number of problems that students got correct. So like if I had 12 problems, let's just say, then I would say if you have one to four correct, it's an X. If you have five to nine to eight, sorry, eight correct, it's a line. And if you have nine to 12 correct, it's a check. So that's what I would do to show me. And then I can very, very easily sort through them. Like, okay, you got three correct, you're right here. And it's very, very simple. I also like to add a little check mark or a 100 next to students' names if they got a 100 because some activities I will actually excuse them from. If we're doing, you know, just like recalling things, I'll let them just do something totally different so that they're not really, really bored. So I'm gonna make up some fictional names really quick to give you an example. So I just 100% made up a whole bunch of things. So I just wrote them down on the sheets of paper, really easy. Now, once I have these, I have different options for how I can do things. I can do tiered instruction, which means like everybody is doing a coloring sheet or a worksheet or something, but one of them is more difficult than the other one or I could do like centers and split the kids up into groups. That is one of the main ways that I do my differentiation is in groups during centers. So what I would do from here is I would look through and I would see how many kids. So I have a three on this one, I have two on this one, 
and I have seven on this one. So what I would probably do is to make those into the most even groups I can and take one of the kids from the check and put them onto the line. And I usually will write their name, so I'm even gonna do that, let's see. I'll take Artie off, stick him on the line, and then I will put a little check next to his name so that I remember I switched him to a different group because of numbers, but he was still in that top one. And by the middle of the year, I know my kids well enough that I can usually figure out who would be the best person to move up a level or down a level to make sure it works. That also helps with behavior. If you have kids that just cannot be together, you can flip flop them one or the other. Of course, you can make as many groups as you want and you could have like, 10 different tiers, but I like to stick to two or three. So normally I do three different ones for my centers. I'll link a blog post about how I do my centers down below so I don't have to get into it. With centers, I do six groups, so I would have had two groups on each one. I just didn't for this, but you can see like I have two groups on here, so I just have two different columns on the same one, and that's how I would know what center the kids or what group the kids are in for centers. I also use it for tiered instruction. Like I mentioned, if you're going to hand like one, pa some kids get one paper, some kids get another, but they're doing a similar activity. Um, and how I would do that is I would definitely do, you know, all the checks get one activity, all the X's get another. And the ones in the middle, there's different ways you could handle that. You could either give them a third activity or you could just flip up them into one or the other. And sometimes I'll even ask them, I'm like, do you want to do like an easier version or do you want a challenge? And I think that also helps because the kids get to take a little bit of ownership. So my sticky notes show me how I'm going to group my students. I just stick these onto their seating chart so I don't forget. And it's very, very simple. Personally, because we have 650 students, I wouldn't go farther than having three different tier levels of kids. Um, even if you just want to do two, like they understand the standard and they don't understand the standard, that would be fine too. Don't be pressured because the classroom teachers do, you know, five or six different reading groups. That doesn't mean that you have to do that because they see those kids every single day, all day. So it is totally different. It's fine if you don't. There's some very simple and easy ways that you can differentiate. And I, again, will link some blog posts about that and some products down below to help you out if you're just getting started. Another huge bonus to having the students already sorted for centers is that it takes all the guesswork out of who's going where. So in the past when I did centers, I just like sent kids places. So I'd be like, okay, well, you know, we have 20 kids and I have, or we have 18 kids and six groups, so I need three kids and I'm just like picking random people. And now I can just go, okay, you, 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 go there. And it takes a lot less time. It is so much quicker, so much faster, so much better. So definitely, definitely worth it. It does take a little bit of time at the beginning, especially if you're doing a pretest for all of your students for the whole year. But I truly believe it was worth it. Like it took me a reasonable amount of time at the very beginning to get that kind of stuff sorted, but it really helped me all throughout and I only had to do it once. And then every few months I will go back and update based on a new activity to see if anyone needs to move up or down, especially if we change to a different unit. Like if we were working really hard on rhythm and now we're working on treble clef or we're working on recorder or different things like that, I'll adjust for them. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found this video interesting and helpful. If you did find it helpful, please make sure that you like, subscribe, and share so that other people will find it helpful. And if you have any helpful hints about how you differentiate or you do centers or you do anything like this, please let me know down in the comments because I am always looking for new things that I can instill and I'm sure that other people are as well. Have a wonderful week.